Okay, so we're going to do talk about um, large intestines now. Okay. So the first thing that um, the first topic that's covered in this part is water balance. So it's important to realize that once again, there's a lot of water going into the GI tract. I mean, not as much as the kidneys, but we have to reabsorb most of it or we're going to be, um, water will be dehydrated. Okay, so the digestive tract receives nine and a half, or nine liters of water a day. So they say about 0.7 is in food, about two liters is in drink, and then 6.7 liters is in secretions. Okay, now it's important to realize that um, eight liters of it is going to be reabsorbed or absorbed by the small intestines and about a liter is going to be absorbed by the large intestines. I probably won't ask you those numbers, but I want you to realize that the small intestines are really important for um, absorption. Okay, now the water is going to be absorbed by osmosis, which that, that makes sense. Okay, and the um, it's going to follow salt. So when the salt goes in or the organic compounds like um, amino acids go in, the water will follow. And yeah, I know you all know this. So dehydrate, de diarrhea occurs when the water doesn't get absorbed. Okay, so um, the feces will pass through too quickly and absorption won't occur if the small intestines or the large intestines are irritated or inflamed. Um, so that could be caused by could be caused by an autoimmune disease. Um, it could be caused by uh, an infection, like a virus or a bacterial infection. Um, diarrhea or will also occur, or um, the feces will be more liquid if they have a high concentration of sol solute, like lactose. So if you can't digest milk sugar. It can cause diarrhea. You can also think about um, like some, some um, like a baby when they're just taking a bottle. Okay, if you increase the amount of sugar, like if you give them apple juice or something, what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of sugar, and that'll pull the water. So that'll increase the water that goes into the small intestines and the large intestines, and that'll make the feces go through more easily. Same thing with like prunes and grown-ups, or some of the um, laxatives like Miralax. What we're doing is we're increasing the um, amount of solutes. Okay, and then the water will follow that. Okay, so here's large intestines. So if we, I don't know why I have two pictures, I guess this, oh, all right, I don't know what I did here, but um, if we look here at this small picture, you can see here is where the small intestines will hook into the large intestines. Okay, the cecum is this blind pouch where they're gonna line up. Okay, so the small intestines, let me go over here, small intestines comes in, okay, so the ileum comes in, but where it lines up, it's not, it's not that we line up exactly like this, we line up more like this. So this part is the cecum, okay, and it's considered a blind pouch, so sometimes food gets stuck in there, and that's um, where appendicitis can occur. So here's the appendix which is just hanging off the edge. It's just like the size of like a pinky finger. Okay, and then the cecum. Okay, the ileocecal valve, that's the connection. Okay, then we're gonna go, we have the ascending colon is going up. Okay, and then the right colic flexure is the bend, and then transverse colon. Okay, so there's transverse colon. And then we have the left colic flexure, okay, which is just the bend, and then the descending colon. Then we're going to go into the sigmoid colon, which is kind of shaped like an S, which is sigmoid, and then the rectum and the anal canal or the, an the anus. Um, there's a lot of stuff, extra stuff on here. So these pouches are called hostra. Each one is a hostrum. 
Okay, and they're, they're pouches. And then this um, band right here, they don't have it labeled. This band is kind of a remnant of a layer of muscle. It's the tinea coli. Okay, and you can think of it, it kind of creates ruffles. So you could think of, a, uh, of um, oh shoot, um, like a valance, a curtain, or valance, however you say it. Um, and how you, you put the curtain on the curtain rod and you and you kind of push, there's too much fabric and you push it all together. That's kind of what the hostra are. They're these pouches and the tinea coli would be like the curtain rod going through, except it's, it's muscle, it's not a curtain rod. Um, sometimes at these bends, like when you have a baby, this is where gas gets stuck, okay, because it's got to make that bend. All right. Um, now, if we look at th this little picture of the anus, okay, so here's the rectum coming in, okay, and there's the anus. The muscles, the levator ani are, is right here, okay. Um, the anal canal, there's going to be um, veins in there, okay. Two sphincters, so the internal anal sphincter is involuntary, and the external anal sphincter, which is voluntary. So it's going to work like the urethra and um, urination. Okay. All right, so large intestines, it, it's going to receive about a liter of material from the small intestines. Mainly what it's going to do is it's going to absorb water and sodium and chloride. About a milliliter, 100 milliliters of water is lost every day as feces. Okay, so the um, large intestines, even though they call it the large intestines, it's shorter than the small intestines, but the diameter is bigger. Okay, so it's about five feet long um, and two and a half inches in diameter. Okay, and we talked about the cecum, and the appendix hangs off the cecum, and then the valve, the ileocecal valve is going to control, so it's going to control the um, movement from small intestines to large intestines. And we already talked about this, and we talked about that, and there's the rectum. Okay, so the histology is way more simple. So it's the mucosa is just simple columnar epithelium. There aren't any circular folds or villi to increase the surface area, but there are intestinal crypts, and they only produce mucus. So the mucus is there to reduce friction. It's a lubricant. Okay, now, in the, the gut, there's a whole big thing, and if you take me for micro, we'll definitely talk about a lot about the microbiome. So the microbiome is a big push to study. So it's all the microorganisms that actually normally live in your body. So in the large intestines, there are um, microbes that are supposed to be there, and they're beneficial to you. Okay, so they're going to digest complex carbohydrates. They'll help break down proteins. They'll help help break down lipids. Um, they do produce carbon dioxide, um, hydrogen sulfide, which is um, like the sulfur smell, um, methane gas, and then some other gases too. One important thing that they do is they're going to help synthesize vitamins B and K. And there's a whole bunch on the this guy, James Craig Fentner Institute, jcvi.org. He's done some research on the microbiome. There's also a bunch on the NIH website if you're interested in it. Well, we talk about it in microbiology. Okay, so the rectum is going to expand to store feces. There are rectal valves, okay, um, to keep things from leaking out. So that's pre to prevent leakage. Now, the anal canal, there are, so the anal canal is right in here. Um, there are columns, okay, there's um, anal sinuses, the sinuses actually release mucus, which is going to be a lubricant. There are um, veins in here that are, they are called the hemorrhoidal veins. They can become hemorrhoids if they, it's like varicose veins of your anus.
So the veins become too weak, the valves weaken, and then the blood pulls. And they can be hereditary, or they can be a result of pushing too much. And then the internal anal sphincter is um, involuntary. Okay, and then the external anal sphincter is um, voluntary. Okay. Um, the movements in um, the large intestines, so they do have weak peristalsis, so we're moving things along through peristalsis, but we also have this thing called hostral churning. So what happens, okay, so if these are the hostra, so these are the pouches, okay, what happens is um, the, the feces, or the what's going to become the feces, okay, it's going to um, move from one hostrum to the next. Okay, so the relaxed hostrum fills, reflex contractions, increases churning, okay, and the movements, it just moves from hostrum to hostrum, okay, down the large intestines. Okay, mass movements occur usually after or during a meal, and they're um, two to three times a day. So it's more powerful um, peristaltic contractions, and it's the tinea coli is what's doing it. Okay, so it, they begin in the middle of the transverse colon, and they're going to hopefully st um, stimulate a bowel movement. Okay, so it forces the feces to move across the transverse colon and down the descending colon. Okay, so two major reflexes from the large intestines. So one is called the gastrocolic reflex. So when the stomach actually distends, okay, so when you eat, the stomach distends, it stretches, and that's going to cause um, movement, okay, and that causes mass movement. Okay, so that's kind of like you eat and then you have to poop. I know, so sophisticated. Okay, now the defecation reflex, here's what happens. Okay, the rectum fills and it stretches. So that's going to start the urge to defecate. Sensory input goes to the spinal cord. Okay, then the parasympathetic nervous system is going to um, increase its stimulus to the sigmoid colon and the rectum. The per, um, parasympathetic nervous is going to... Um, tell the internal anal sphincter to relax, okay? So that relaxes, okay? And then your brain says, um, is it the time, is it the place? And the cerebral cortex will tell the external anal sphincter to relax. And then you push down, you bear down by holding your breath and pushing down on your abdomen. And that's going to force the feces out, okay? So defecation reflex. And I think I'm sure that. No, I don't. There's pictures of that. It's not that tricky of, that, of everything that you've learned. Okay, so disorders. So I have colorectal cancer on here. So it's the second most common type of cancer in the U.S. Most of the time it, it occurs in the um, distal descending colon, the sigmoid colon, or the rectum. And mainly because that has the longest contact with, the, with your feces. So the feces has waste in it that could be um, stressing out the cells and the cells could could mutate. Okay, so um, polyps, this is a polyp. Okay, a polyp, those are outgrowths of the mucosa. So if they do, a, if you do a colonoscopy, they'll go in and they can remove these polyps and then they'll um, biopsy them. Okay, so risk factors, so maybe not enough fiber in the diet, definitely um, family history, ulcerative colitis, and with anything, the older we get, the more likely that our cells mutate and are damaged. Um, if the the cancer is limited to the mucosa, okay, the five-year-old survivor rate is really good, but however, if it's deeper, the prognosis is worse. Okay, so the key is early detection. So they recommend at age 50 that you start um, do fecal occult blood tests, so you're looking for blood in the feces. They do a sigmoidoscopy and a colonoscopy. So sigmoid colon and then the colon. Okay, um, and you guys know this, but I guess we, so the colon and large intestines are the same, okay? that They, they equal the same thing, and that they just use different different terms, so no, no big deal. Um, 
some other disorders. So diverticulitis, um, are those are just bulges, just <laughs> or diverticulosis. These are bulges in the intestines, and then when they get inflamed, is diverticulitis. Yeah, so these are like the pouches, and then things can get trapped in there and cause inflammation. And then two other disorders that are on here is constipation. Okay, so you can't poop, and lots of medications cause that, and then um, diarrhea.